anytime that you're dealing with anything dealing with money in prison, there's a pretty good likelihood that fighting's gonna come along with that at some point. Because for some strange reason, money plus prison usually tend to equal problems. And this very first fight ever that I won while locked up dealt with exactly both of those. Money plus prison equaling a problem that I had to deal with. So the next week rolls around and again this time D doesn't have these damn commissary items. And he tells me this time, he says, hey guess what man, those items, they ain't come again. But you've got this big bag of commissary right here. How in the hell did these items not come again? And what he tells me after that is he says, uh, you know, we should probably just go ahead and forget about those commissary items because obviously they're not coming. Now, you know, this is like the first time that I've done a tattoo where I did it before I got paid. And with that, I'm not getting paid. With that, this person is actually just trying to buck on me. But I go over to D's bunk area and I walk right up in his cut, right up on him while he's sitting in his chair putting his items away. And all I say to him when he looks up at me is, so you're just not going to pay me? Mm. I hit this dude with everything I have before he ever gets a chance to utter one single word. When I hit this guy, I don't even know where this hit came from. Maybe this was like strength that I had in me that I never even knew I had. Maybe this was pent up from all of those losses that I had taken where I just knew at this moment in time I had to do this. When I connected, I mean, that basically took all the fight out of D right there. In fact, this guy put up virtually no fight whatsoever, making me feel like this first hit that connected really did some damage, and I did not let up there. I mean, I gave this dude everything that I had. When it was finally over and somebody was grabbing me, pulling me off of him, all right, Joe, all right, he's had enough. The entire time I'm saying, I bet you never try to not pay me again. I bet you never try that shit again. And though even after that fight, I still didn't ever get paid, there's this unwritten rule while in prison. You either pay or you pay in another type of a way. And this guy, D, definitely paid in a different type of a way. And there's things about this that I guess I'll just never understand. I mean, here's this guy who bucks on me after owing me $20 and just must think that I'm just not going to do anything at all about this. Because he was definitely caught off guard when I walked right up into his bunk area and pretty much laid him out with that first hit. Boom! <sighs> So I guess all parties involved in this learned a lesson with this. One, don't ever underestimate anybody while in prison. Two, if you do somebody wrong, you better be on your guard after that. And three, the lesson that I learned in this was, well shit, not everyone who appears to be this big bad motherfucker in prison really is at all. But like I said at the beginning, this glory that I had after winning this fight, this victory, this victorious feeling that I had, I thought I was ready for the UFC after this fight. All of this that I was feeling, this cockiness, this level one super tough guy, super thug life, you can't do nothing to me. You see what I just did to Dirty D? I'll do that to you too. All of this super extra shit that I was feeling at this time, yeah, it, it pretty much went right out the window like the following month. Because for about a month, I was able to carry around this air of confidence, this air of macho tough guyness shit that I had with me. But the following month, I ended up getting in a fight with another guy by the name of Shelton because of my super arrogant feeling macho tough demeanor that I was carrying about with me, thinking that at any time somebody was looking at me wrong or disrespecting me. Hey, yo, what did you just say to me, Shelton? <laughs> Where am I? Am I in prison? Yeah, me and this other guy by the name of Shelton ended up getting into a fight. It's not even a fight at all. This guy hit me one time and knocked me out, put me to sleep. All because I was thinking I was this tough guy that I really wasn't. And I, uh, I was running my mouth. Hey, Shelton, what did you just... Hey man, uh, what are you locked up for? And I tell him, I say, I got a felony grand larceny charge. And from there, he's asking me a few more questions, like how old am I? I tell him I'm 18 years old. He's asking me if I had ever been in trouble before. I'm telling him, no, this is my first rodeo, basically. And again, mind you, I am completely green at this point. I have no idea, like, 
things I'm supposed to say, things I'm not supposed to say. Maybe during this time when he's asking me, what's your record like? Have you ever been in trouble before? Maybe then I should have been telling him, yeah, this grand larceny charge really ain't that bad. I mean, previously I had killed a bunch of people. But again, me being green and not really knowing any better, I'm just telling him, yeah, this is my first time being locked up. I do have a bond and I'm hoping to get bonded out. But what about you? What are you locked up for? And this is where the entire unforgettable cellmate really starts to come into play. But he tells me he ends up going into this bank. And he tells me that when he walks into this bank, the first thing that he sees and hears is his friend standing on the counter of this bank with this mask on and this gun out, waving it around and yelling, yo, where is the money? I cannot even imagine what it would be like to be in a situation like that. And I'm also damn thankful that I've never found myself in one of those types of situations as well. With the amount of charges that this guy showed me, with the severity of these charges as well, and then throw in the fact that this happened when I was 18 years old. That was something like 15, 16 years ago. There is a very good chance, I mean, it's probably like 99.9% .9 guaranteed that this guy Slim is still locked up right now. Hey, yo, look at Vito putting that lotion and colored pencil in his hair. That ain't never gonna work. That girl's gonna know you like 50 or 60 years old, man. Hey, yo, you see Vito in this bathroom putting this hair color in his hair, thinking this little young girl ain't gonna know he's really 50 years old? He's basically smiling from ear to ear saying, Oh, y'all that made fun of this right here? This work. This work. I got that little bad young girl in there thinking I ain't nothing but 29 years old. You see, Vito was one of these guys who was on the phone all the time. And it was with this other woman that he would spend all of his time talking to on the phone. And in fact, a lot of the times he wasn't even talking with this woman, he was arguing with her. Hey, yo, who is that in the background while I hear that dude back there? I know somebody's over there at that house. Who's over there with you? Is that Jody in the background with you? Hey, baby, did you send me that money so I could order commissary? I love you. You see the guards back there? They're going through all of Vito's stuff. No shit, I'm sitting here watching the same thing you're watching. Yeah, you're right. I mean, I, I completely forgot. You're right here as well looking at the same thing I'm looking at. Hey, yo, Vito, what, what did you do, man? They're saying some pretty crazy stuff about you out there. Yeah, man, I know, man. I know. I fucked up, man. And that was his excuse, that he fucked up. They're trying to take me back to court and give me more time. Said the prosecutor's trying to bury me in this. You had phone sex with a 15-year-old girl. You are damn near 50. If this guy, for whatever reason, was butthurt or in his feelings or mad about whatever, he would then take it out on the entire housing unit. And you gotta imagine that in these housing units, there was 100 prisoners per housing unit. So all it would take is like one prisoner to get this guy in his feelings or mad about whatever. And then, yeah, we wouldn't even get any rest. But Fat Bastard came into this housing unit and he made this announcement that was like one of the craziest things I had ever heard in my life. But he said something along the lines of, all you white boys in here are scared to death. Y'all ain't gonna bust the grape. Y'all ain't gonna do nothing. Y'all some pussies. And again, I have no idea why this guy came into this housing unit and said this. But when he did, all of a sudden, shit absolutely hit the fan. All of a sudden, you've got all of these AB dudes jumping up, basically talking shit right back to him. Man, fuck you, you fat mother And I mean, it was a hell of a lot worse than just that. And then next, and for whatever reason, all of a sudden, these blood and crypt dudes jumped up at the same time. I gotta tell you, like, what I remember most from this situation was just how thick the racial tension inside of this housing unit became in that damn moment. All because of what this prison guard came into the housing unit and said. They get you naked, they tell you to turn around, squat down, grab your little junies. Well this, well this is pretty awkward. And throughout all of the time that I spent locked up, I definitely spent my fair share of time in solitary confinement. And not once ever for being batshit crazy or in protective custody, but every single time, for getting in trouble. And while doing this tattoo, this lookout said to me, Hey Joe, the front door just opened. The guards are coming in here right now. No sooner than he says this to me, I'm taking the gloves off, I'm taking the tattooing stuff, and I'm throwing it right in the toilet, trying to flush all of this down the toilet. By this point, there is a guard literally standing right outside the door to the cell, looking right at me as I'm flushing this stuff down the toilet, saying to me, What are you doing? What are you flushing down the toilet? <laughs> And you know, during this time, I'm just hoping all of this stuff is actually going to flush. 
Oh, you thought you could do whatever you wanted to do in this jail, huh? You thought you was just gonna run your own little business doing this tattoo work inside of this jail, huh? You didn't know your cellmate was a snitch, huh? <laughs> y'all guards, I don't give a about this jail. I'm gonna do whatever the fuck I wanna do. Oh, you think you're a tough guy, huh? And what you don't know is that you're about to get a street charge for doing tattoo work inside of this jail. Oh, what? What? When you first walk into that solitary confinement isolation cell block, it's almost like you're immediately punched in the face by the odor. What the f I mean, it really smells like there's not even any toilets in there. It smells like an upside down Porter John that's been on a construction site for like 15 years. I walked right out there in front of all of those guys and mind you, every single guy who was in that housing unit at that time could have beaten my ass. But even with that, I still walked right out there in front of all of those guys and said, I don't know which one of y'all did it, but whichever one of y'all stole my commissary, you tell me you did it. Tell me right now you did it. Be a man about it and tell me to my face. You took those items from me. And you know, as I'm going absolutely berserk inside of this housing unit, I mean, I was basically just putting on a show for these guys because all they ended up doing was just laughing at me. <laughs> hey, you ain't gonna do nothing. <laughs> but I'm damn sure gonna be eating all of your commissary tonight. <laughs> you're never, <laughs> and you're never even gonna know about it. I mean, you know, if I could actually go back and see myself back then when I was 18 years old first serving time, I'm sure it would be absolutely embarrassing to me at this point. And then they'll come back in from either the rec yard or chow or from wherever else and go back to either their bunk area or cell only to see that all of their things have been stolen. And in a lot of those cases, those so-called tough guy prisoners will pretty much do exactly what I did when I was 18 years old in that cell block and all of my things have been stolen. Go out in front of the entire housing unit trying to break bad. I wish I knew which one of y'all went in my cell or in my bunk area and took all my stuff. I swear to God, if I knew which one of y'all it was, I'd beat the shit out of you right now. This other prisoner walked right up to him and told him, hey yo, I stole your shoes. And then proceeded to beat the shit out of this sex offender so-called tough guy prisoner, literally stomping this guy out with that brand new pair of shoes that he had just stolen from that guy on. He's already out. Oh my God. I haven't seen this guy in forever. Look at this guy. Just made some new friends. Dude, Already, I just got out. Oh my gosh. Dude, it's great to see you, man. <laughs> hey, man. It's great to see you. at last. Free at last. I ain't got one on me now. I'm sorry, but I don't this think is... I got them on me. Good man. That's what I always do this way. Oh, yeah. oops. My bad. All right, we're getting it out of here. We're, we're just picking our friend up. We're ready to enjoy the free world. Come on, Yanni, get in the car. We're out of here. We're leaving. Well, you know, that was kind of short-lived. I mean, I, I wanted to enjoy and bask in the moment, but uh, you're getting... I, we better get the hell out of here before they lock me up again. They might write you a charge. Yanni, you're free! As you're being escorted down the hall by these guards to your cell block, you're gonna pass by other cell blocks as you're going to wherever they're taking you to. And as you're passing by these cell blocks, there's these windows that look right out into the hallway. And anytime anybody new or anytime anybody's even being escorted for whatever reason, you're gonna have prisoners right there at those windows, beating on those windows. Hey, yo, right back! Hey, fresh me! What you doing, fresh me? What you doing in here, fresh me? What your charges in, fresh me, white boy? And you're dealing with all of these dudes beating and banging and screaming at you as you're in handcuffs and being led to, again, whichever cell block you're gonna be going to. Hey, yo, white boy, I see you right there, white boy, with some of them junior cases with your charges in, white boy. And as I'm looking at all of these guys, I'm really not seeing anybody that I, that I know, I'm trying not to look anybody in their eyes. That guy just blew a kiss at me. Fuck. He was like, yo, 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 white boy, white boy. Oh, shit, wait a minute, hey. Hey, that's Joe, I know that dude. And again, with all of the time that I ended up spending in this cell block with this dude, Brad, this dude that I was cool with in the free world and, and cool with up until the point where he told me that he was gonna do anything and snitch on anybody that he could in an effort to not have to do any time for that robbery that he was sitting in jail for. Somewhere along the line, he told me that he had learned this entire gang sign language alphabet and would just be sitting off in the corner for like hours at a time paying attention to every word that was signed through those windows between the gang members in our cell block and from the cell block across the hall. But for the entire course of time that I spent in this cell block with Brad, these dudes were none the wiser that he was doing what he was doing. Paying attention to every letter that they signed through those big old cell block windows. You know, one thing that you don't ever, ever want to do in the system, jail, prison, either or, doesn't matter, 
is ever roll out because it, it, sometimes it gets really hot. Yes, it's very cold sometimes, but but other times it's scalding hot. And in that case, you don't want to wear your two piece. You don't want to wear your jumpsuit. You want to wear shorts, but they don't sell shorts. So what do you do? You wear two pairs of boxers. It's a that's a Ducey ball. Now some guys go Tracy ball, and that's three know, that's, pairs. That's what you call a power move is the Tracy ball. Now, if you're exhibiting, if you're trying to, you know, if you're trying to sell something, i.e. ass, AC ball. AC ball is just one pair. That way you get the full outline, you get the shape, you got the, I mean, everybody knows exactly what your ball sack looks like. And if they're interested, you know, they know you're on the market. So you got the AC, AC ball, ball I don't the Ducey do ball, balls. the Tracy ball. What did you do? You did the AC ball or you did the not a ball? <laughs> so how many times did you drop the soap? Who could, I can't even count that high. And what happened when you would drop the soap? Talk about that. Like, is that a thing? Because so many people ask, oh, how many times did you drop the soap? Did you drop the soap? Like, just talk about that. You drop the soap in the shower. Uh, is there a big commotion? Yeah, I mean, look, if you drop the soap in the, in the shower, you've seen it on the movies before. You've heard the jokes. I mean, I certainly have. I know Joe has. Um, but you've seen it even if you've never been locked up. You've seen it and you've heard it. Um, yeah, I mean, if you drop the soap, this is a this is a fatal mistake, ladies and gentlemen. If you drop the soap, um, you're gonna get a wiener in your butt. That's pretty much a lead pipe block. So just no, you're not gonna get a. It's nothing. It's ridiculous. I've you know we drop the soap all the time. Uh, I've never. Nobody's once, like, oh, look at him trying to soap. No, because if you said that, then you're acknowledging that you're looking at another man bent over. Or you're listening to them in the shower, paying attention to their every single breathing move back there behind that little shower. And which you know is happening. Right. Now that's 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 a guarantee. You know, out of any, you know, out of fifty guys that you're somebody, locked up with, there's, somebody there's five of them yeah. are watching every single move you make. They're watching you. They're clocking you. I mean, they're they're making a list and they're checking it twice. I mean, they're definitely taking notes. I mean, there are guys that literally keep track of how many times. A, a guy week. showers in a week. Yeah, absolutely. That motherfucker ain't showered. That motherfucker ain't showered two and a half days in six hours. Man, he don't ever get in that box. He don't ever get in that mother box. Man, well, there ain't no shots in there. there. Ain't no shots in that motherfucker. Man, get in that box. No stinking ass. Get in that box. There ain't no stinking ass motherfuckers. Hey, what's up, everyone? Hey, have I ever mentioned how stressful being in prison can be? I mean, you might not think it is, but this place really sucks. Especially with everything that's been going on lately, and me just trying to keep my head above water in the midst of all that. Friends dying, which has me feeling like I might not even stand a chance out there. Plus, everyone around me seems depressed beyond hope. I mean, like sitting around with their head in their hands type depressed. You know what? That shit is kind of depressing. So what you just heard right there is the first of three phone calls that I'm going to be playing for you throughout this video. And where these phone calls originated from was the very last prison that I was at and I probably had something like about a year left to serve. When these phone calls were actually recorded, I created this blog called Joe Writes His Wrongs with like two years left to serve. And it was on this blog that I used to chronicle just what it was like to be in prison. I told prison stories on this blog, I drew cartoons, really trying to give people like a visual idea of just what it was like inside of prison. There were also caricatures that I did of guys that I was locked up with. And you know, it's crazy to think about, but this was the actual beginning of After Prison Show. <laughs> What's going on everybody? Welcome to After Prison Show. And the first thing I want to say before we even begin this is please forgive me for my voice. Yesterday we live streamed for 12 and a half hours responding to 4,713 comments uh, from a video that we had done last week about my worst solitary confinement experience ever. I said that if we reached 8,000 likes for that video, we would answer every single comment on that video. And yesterday, that is exactly what we tried to do. And today, we actually had a completely different video planned. But just a little while ago, something happened that actually could have sent me right back to prison today. There was only one thing inside of this envelope. This check right here. This is a cashier's check for $1,950.27 made out to me from a person named Shelly F. Gates. Now, when I first saw this check, I was absolutely confused. I just received the check for $1,950 made out to my name from somebody I've never heard of by the name of Shelly F. Gates. Cashier's check written right across the top of this, a bank that I've never heard of. I'm looking at this check trying to figure out exactly what this is. 
And the first thought that comes to my mind is, maybe, just maybe, this is someone sending me this check as some sort of a donation to After Prison Show. We have never received any sort of donation like this before, but maybe that's what this is. Just imagine had I taken this to my damn bank and tried to deposit this. Hey, some awesome supporter named Shelly F. Gates just donated us almost $2,000. Can you go ahead and cash this or deposit this into my account? My bank would have taken this check, tried to process this, realized this was fraudulent, and then what would have happened? I probably would have been standing at that bank teller window as that woman was back there on the phone with the police saying, hey, there's this guy right out here trying to deposit or cash this fraudulent check. And you know, with the fact that I've got a criminal record, I've been to prison, you think the police or anybody at that bank would believe me that I didn't know that this was a bad check? Had I been that naive to actually take this to the bank and tried to do something with this, my dumb ass would be sitting in jail right now. You see, during most of the time while I was locked up, I was the kind of guy that got up super early. In fact, that's something that I've carried with me since being released and still to this very day, I get up super early. And the reason I began this while I was locked up is because during the day, pretty much 99.9% .9 of the time that you're locked up, it is going to be an absolutely chaotic environment that you're living in. It's going to be loud, guys are going to be screaming and shouting and fighting each other. Yo, I got the TV, change the TV back to Lifetime, I was watching that movie! Times that by 100 other prisoners who are in the housing unit with you, arguing and bitching and yelling over the stupidest of things and just combine all of that together. Hey, I said I got the microwave next, I'm trying to heat up these ramen noodles! 99.9% .9 of the time. And the only time that I could get any kind of peace and quiet, any kind of peace of mind, a time when I could actually think, formulate some thoughts, try to formulate my plan a little better of what I was going to try to accomplish when released would be early in the morning. But I was feeling like a prison date was absolutely needed at this point. So early in the morning, like around 4 or 4.30 in the morning, I decided, hey, why not? Most every other prisoner in this 100-man housing unit is still asleep, minus about a handful of other guys who are just doing whatever, making their coffee, reading a book, reading the newspaper, reading the Bible. But again, you know, I decided this would be a good time to uh, go on a prison date. So I grabbed my plastic chair, I took my prison porn, I put my porn on the chair, I took a sheet, I put my sheet over the porn so nobody could see what I had. But anytime that you would see a guy who was going into the bathroom to go into the shower and he's carrying his chair and on that chair he's got a sheet on that chair, you know damn good and well this is just one of those things that you pick up from doing time, you know what that guy is getting ready to do. <laughs> yeah, he's getting ready to go do that. And it's while I'm trying to give 100% of my attention to what is right in front of my eyes that all of a sudden I see this guy who's in a wheelchair come rolling around the backside of that wall directly right in front of me in that back shower. Whoa, Joe! Uh, what are you- Oh my God, what the what are you doing? Didn't you see the mop stick down right there when you came into the bathroom? Dude, it's like 4 o'clock in the morning. What you doing back here? Well, obviously you saw pretty damn well what I was trying to do. This guy in the wheelchair rolled up on me, saw me on a prison date trying to get some money. Backpedaled just as fast as he could to not get shot. Hey, watch out, man. There's snipers back there in that prison bathroom. You might want to stay out of the gun line. No, of course, this didn't just die right then and there. Of course, everybody heard the commotion of what was going on in this bathroom and as soon as I came out of this bathroom the five or so guys who were awake of course they're laughing at me as I'm carrying my freaking plastic chair with my sheet over it covering up my prison porn back to my bunk area damn Joe you just let that guy roll up on you like that <laughs> And by about 7.30 in the morning after breakfast chow, the entire prison compound had heard about this. Hey, Joe! <laughs> ah, Joe, you got caught! <laughs> Joe! 
He was in a wheelchair, though. You're not a rapper. Are you a rapper? Were you a rapper? I don't think you've ever before mentioned anything about rap. I actually can still remember the very first rap that I ever wrote. And before I show you this video that is the very first After Prison Show video, I'm actually gonna spit you this hot fire lava flow that I wrote at the age of 18 years old when I was sitting in Norfolk City Jail and my then girlfriend at the time, this girl named Brandy, had just broken up with me. I actually wrote this song off of a song that I liked a hell of a lot during that time and it also was an Eminem song and it was a song that I'm quite sure all of you have heard out there, a song called Stan. My tea's gone cold, I'm wondering why. I'm kidding, I'm not doing the chorus part, I didn't. I didn't have that part of it. But I'm going to give you right now this very first ever rap that I wrote. It was based off of the song Stan, except this one was called Brandy. And by the way, if this chick Brandy is watching this video, I'm quite sure that she has no idea that I ever wrote this song or how much she actually did break my 18-year-old little heart while I was locked up and how much I actually cried about this chick. But if you are watching out there, Brandy, I want to let you know one thing. This was a long time ago. Please don't contact me. Okay? We good? Glad we cleared that up. So without further ado, embarrassment level 12. Here is the very first rap that I ever wrote. I cannot even believe I still remember this. Hey, yo. Cody's ready to fucking start laughing. He's probably about to Snapchat this stupid shit. Dear Brandy, well, I don't know why I love you because you caused me so much pain. It's like I'm losing my mind. I think I'm going insane. I try to maintain, but that seems impossible. I can't control these feelings. This pain's unstoppable. And I don't know why I write you because you never write me back. <laughs> Damn it. I tried to call you, but the number's blocked. What's up with that? Lately, I've been stressing and having panic attacks. I just want to know how you're doing. Is that too much to ask? Well, you know I love you and you promised me forever. I remember you used to tell me that we'd always be together. Well, I hope you get this letter and I hope that you're okay. I really need to hear from you. This is Jay. Hey, yo, Rice Gum, watch the fuck out. Because y'all ain't ready for old Joe rapping. So let's just go ahead and move on to this very first ever video that I ever created for After Prison Show. And mind you, I had only been home from prison at this point for two weeks. Two weeks after my release, I was released on October 13, 2015. And two weeks later, I wrote this rap on the very same day that this was filmed. And also, please keep in mind, I had no prior film experience whatsoever. So these cutscenes that I included in this, I mean, well, fuck it. I'll just go ahead and show you this and let you be the judge of it. You know, sometimes all you have is a dream and a plan to see that dream through. But on the flip side of the coin, they say a goal without a timeline is just that, a dream. Well, guess what? My timeline is now. See, I just lost seven years of my life that I'll never get back. But for those seven years, my flame didn't die. This fire that burns inside me, it still burns. And what I'm trying to create, an avenue for us all to learn. Joe writes his wrongs. Imagine coming home after prison and your rights is gone. No job, education, or trade, but you got bills due because your lights is on? <laughs> you ever seen the struggle from my side? When dudes come home from prison, try right for living, but can't catch a break because this world ain't offering lifelines? Well, they say what you ain't offered, you gotta go take. But nah, I'm done with all that. I say now what you ain't offered, you gotta create. You gotta go make. A new avenue, exposure for a grown problem right here on this tape. Men and women are coming home after prison with nothing. Tossed back out into the world after years cut off from it and told now go beat something? Yeah, what are the chances of that? Are people more likely to make it out here? or end up going right back. Well, that's why I'm here trying to do my part. I'm trying to help be a solution to a problem that ain't been right from the start. Raise awareness for what little's being done to prepare individuals going back into society after prison. That's the whole premise of my web series slash reality show after prison. Because even though it ain't easy and the odds are stacked up against you after prison, people really can make it and succeed with a strong support system in a web series slash reality show like after prison. 
And you know, just to give you a little better idea of what old K Weaver old sunshine looked like for those of you who may not be familiar, check out this old mean mug prison picture me and Kenny took together. We're looking like some stone cold savages in this picture and my God, I just look absolutely ridiculous. Most people who are serving time do not have a lot, if any, outside support. They're not making phone calls, they're not getting visits or letters or anything like that or having any kind of contact with the free world. So again, in a lot of cases, you guys are all you have. You're gonna be around this person more than you've ever been around anybody in your life. And this is something that I consider can help make friendships that last forever. Because think about your best friend that you have out here in the free world. Do you see that person every single day? Maybe you do. Do you see that person 24 hours a day? Do you live with that person, sleep with that person, shit with that person, eat with that person, shower with that person? Are you around your best friend that damn much? If you are, there's a fucking problem with that. I'm just, I'm just gonna tell you, that's, that's not normal. I got back to my bunk and I saw laying on my bunk there was this folded up piece of paper. I didn't know if this was a love letter from somebody who wanted to rendezvous with me in the showers later. I was ready to take my plastic prison spork and start sharpening that on the ground as I was unfolding this letter. But I end up unfolding this piece of paper and this is what it was. This crazy thing that you're looking at right here that doesn't look like much of anything, this is a prison birthday card that old K Weaver, K Dog, Kenny, Mr. Sunshine had made for me. And you know, as sketchy as this may appear to be, I mean, this act of kindness right here was by far the nicest damn thing that ever happened to me while I was locked up. Kenny had no money whatsoever. It wasn't even like he could go buy me a $1 prison birthday card from commissary. But this guy actually took the time to put this together for me. And even though what's written on here may seem a little crazy, you gotta imagine that while locked up, guys will laugh and joke and try in whatever way they can to make the time a little better. So this prison made birthday card that Kenny put together for me is a perfect example of trying to do just that. Happy B-Day, Jay. Sorry this pool was the only thing that I got you this year. Hope it fits, buddy. Look into my eyes, not my pipe. You're a great dude, Jay. You have a mindset that can take you anywhere. Free JG, your homeboy, Sunshine. I mean, you've got books and you've got TV and, and then you've got poker and, and that's in spades. And that, that's about it. That's about all you can do. So if you like watching television, you like movies, you know, you're going to want to watch some TV. You want to get it, get in front of that box, which is what they call it. You know, they call it what? Look, looking at that box. They looking call it the trick box. The trick Man, box. You better watch out for that trick box. Yo, that trick box. Yeah, because it'll trick you up. And this, so going down to 87, you know, sort of dovetail into my original point. When you, the craziest thing, literally television wars. You know, everybody wants to have their hands on that remote. There's one remote control and there's 15 people on that block. And then, so you, there's a struggle for this thing. It's usually the alpha male prisoner in there who's going to be controlling this TV. Yeah, I mean, a lot of times it's divided by gangs. It can be divided by race. Uh, you know, it could be the white guys. If the if the, if there's a, if the if the, the white people if there's a, if there's more whites than than blacks, or if there are more Mexicans than whites or blacks, or if there are more blacks than than whites and Mexicans, the predominant, or if there's Bloods and Crips and Aryan Brotherhood, whoever whoever has the strength in numbers is going to be the person to control the television. Well, let's take it back to Friday. If Debo's in the block, Debo's watching TV. But again, Ernie finally reached the point where he said he was not going to give CB anything else. And then what do you know, right after he says this, old CB comes hobbling around the corner. Ernie, what you doing over there, Ernie? Ernie, Ernie, come here, Ernie. And Ernie didn't just tell CB that he wasn't going to give him a coffee or anything else for that matter. In fact, Ernie basically told the entire housing unit, I ain't giving you nothing else, CB. You just want to use me for all my stuff. Because, you know, the entire housing unit knew that CB was just using Ernie. And once Ernie realized this himself, he told anyone or anyone within earshot uh, just how he was going to handle this situation. And as soon as Ernie broadcast that to the entire housing unit in CB's direction, this was received by CB obviously not so well. CB sat there looking dumbfounded for a moment. 
But then from there, these two immediately began to exchange words. They started arguing right there because CB was basically put on blast by Ernie as he broadcast this to the entire housing unit. CB, I told you you only want to do nothing but use me for my coffee. I ain't giving you nothing else. What you talking about, Ernie? Talking about how to use you for your coffee. You ain't got nothing. You just a little crack monster motherfucker from the mountain. I'm a crack monster. Look at you, motherfucker. Your lips more chapped than you been sucking on a goddamn bottle of baby powder. Oh, that's it, goddamn Ernie. You are talking to me like that. And from there, things escalated into the funniest damn fight I had ever seen while locked up. Now, both of these guys had absolutely zero fight game whatsoever. Have you ever seen, like, two people fight who can't fight and they're just flailing arms? They're just like... And it was during that preliminary hearing where I went crazy inside of the courtroom. I just could not take it anymore. And it was because of something the judge said to me that absolutely made me lose my mind and flip out inside of this courtroom, causing me to get an additional charge and also coming very, very close to having these guards inside of that courtroom beat my ass. Hey, uh, just to let you know, we can go ahead and appeal this and go ahead and take this charge upstairs, too. That good old public defender giving me some good old public defender information. But as my so-called lawyer was telling me this, the judge heard everything that my lawyer had just said to me. And before I even had a chance to say one word, and mind you, I was not about to appeal this at all. I knew I was facing a lot of time, so these 60 days meant nothing to me in comparison to the grand scheme of things. But before I could utter one single syllable word, anything, before I could even take a breath, like, uh, the judge looked square at me and said this, and I dare you to appeal this, because with as much time as you're facing upstairs, they are going to absolutely light you up when you get up there. I snatched the mic off the podium, threw that shit on the ground. I'm not in handcuffs, by the way. And there also was this little mic that was sitting right there in front of me, but I snatched that mic up, threw that shit on the ground, and literally began to escort myself out of the courtroom, saying all the while, this shit. And as I'm walking myself back to jail by myself, unescorted, the judge says to me, what did you say? So I repeated myself, this shit. The judge then says, that's a contempt of court. That's 10 days right there. 10 days? Hey, don't threaten me with a good time. I mean, I'm already facing damn near life right here. So with that, I turn around and I look dead at the judge and I say to him, and you too. And the judge follows up with saying, that's another 10 days right there. By this point, the deputies from the courtroom have damn near football tackled me through the door that leads into the little holding cell hallway, right there where guys are held in those cells waiting to go into the courtroom from the jail. And by the way, there were other prisoners sitting in those cells waiting to go into that same courtroom I was being football tackled out of. And you know, just to throw this out there, when you're sitting in those holding cells with those other prisoners, everybody's waiting to go into the courtroom. One thing that's always on the minds of those prisoners in those holding cells is What type of mood is the judge in? Man, when I go in that courtroom, I really hope that judge is in a good mood. I hope nobody's pissed that judge off today. So knowing that that's a major thought in the minds of those prisoners sitting in those holding cells, just imagine what they were thinking as they were seeing me being football tackled out of the courtroom back into the hallway where those holding cells were at. (laughs) Give me that judge! Give me the... Give me the judge! Dude, did you just see the way that guy came out of the courtroom right there? I'm sitting back here for a drunken public. They're probably gonna give me a life sentence now. But even though we would only end up getting hit by the corner of this hurricane, the institution was still placed on lockdown. We were still locked inside of our cells. The water still ended up being cut off. We were fed inside of our cells through a little tray slot, bagged lunches for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And we ended up remaining on this lockdown for I think like a total of three days. But just imagine being locked up in a cell with no running water. The only water that you get is water that they bring you in a cooler to where you can put your cup inside of that cooler to get water out of it. 
and then the absolutely disgusting smell that comes from an entire cell block full of prisoners using the bathroom in toilets that they cannot flush. I mean, it legitimately smelled like a septic tank inside of the cell block for these three days. All three of these guys were the smartest, most articulate, stand up, and also quietest dudes that I had ever been locked up with, and I am proud to have served time with all three of them for all of those reasons that I just mentioned, and also because of the fact that since they've been released, and all of them have been released for well over a year now, they are all doing amazing after prison. And it's also all three of these guys for what they're doing in their own lives that inspires me to keep trying to achieve what I dream of achieving. And I hope in some way by me telling you about these three guys and no matter what you may be going through in your own life, where you're at now or what you've been through, that you also are inspired as well. Because one thing that I've certainly learned and also seen, especially from these three individuals that I've just told you about, is that it matters absolutely none about where you've been. It is completely about where you're trying to go. Hey look, that's it. I hope you enjoyed this video and if you did so, please leave a like and a comment letting me know exactly what you thought about it. As always, until next time, enjoy life, the free world. Never take a moment for granted and make the most of every day. Peace.